Well, we've got some computers in front of us because it's time to talk about cryptographic attacks. Now, when we talk about cryptographic attacks, the easier way to interpret this is cracking passwords. Now, don't get too excited. I know everybody's like, yay, we get to finally get to crack some passwords. Well, first of all, let's make sure we understand what we're talking about when we talk about password cracking. When you have some kind of server, a web server, an FTP server, an SSH server, a game server, a I don't care what kind of, an operating system that's uh, sharing folders, it doesn't matter what it is, you are going to have to have a list of usernames and passwords stored somewhere on that server system. Now, if you're going to store them, well, you have to. When someone logs in, they're, ne they're going to type in a username and password and then come to that server. So, you, you have to store the password. So, how do you store it? Well, you could just store it in clear text. I mean, you can literally have a list somewhere on your hard drive that says Mike, comma, and then whatever his password is, and Bob, comma, and whatever his password is, and Janet, comma, and whatever her password is. And we could do that, but the downside is, is that if a bad guy gets to that server, he could get easy access to our password. So traditionally what we do with a password is that when we create a new user and have them type in a password, the password is never stored on the hard drive. We just hash it. So we just make a hash of the password. Now, if we've got a hash of the password sitting on the server and somebody who is a client wants to log in, what they're going to do is that the server is going to say, please type in your username and password. So they type in a username and password on their side, and then that is hashed. So the hash comes over the internets and then gets to the server. The server compares the hashes, and that's how it logs in. So we, we would really never use clear text except in the most primitive of, of situations. The important thing to understand here is if you want to get into cryptographic attacks, if you want to hack passwords, what you're really doing is hacking hashes. So there's a couple of things that come into play here. Number one, you have to be able to get to those list of hashes first of all. So the, one of the hardest jobs of cryptographic attacks is to how do you get to that server and how do you grab those usernames and password lists? You, you don't know what the passwords are, but how do you at least get the list? That varies for every single thing that's out there. If you want to get your uh, Windows system, it has its own set of passwords and hashes. If you want to get to an FTP server, it depends on the brand, they have their own usernames and passwords. The biggest part of cryptographic attacks really isn't the hacking the hashes. The biggest part is getting to that. And I'm not covering that in this section because there are huge groups of people who spend all kinds of time with all kinds of different stuff to figure out how to get to these different things. The second thing we need to talk about is that if the password is stored in a hash, there is no way for you to reverse that hash to figure out what the password is. It's just not going to happen. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to generate hashes until we get the hash that we have a copy of. And now what we have the copy, we know what this hash is because we generated it ourselves and then we know what the password is. So when we're talking about cryptographic attacks, and in particular we're going to talk about brute force attacks and dictionary attacks and rainbow tables and all that kind of stuff, keep in mind what we're doing more than anything else is generating hashes and making a comparator. When we compare the right ones, then we finally can say we have the password. So I want to go through this process a little bit, and the best way to do this is to pick an arbitrary server to attack. So in this case, I'm going to use a program called FreeSSH, and I've got it right here. So this is FreeSSH. FreeSSH is a wonderful little SSH and Telnet server. I've been using this thing for years and years. Nothing special about it, but one of the things that's kind of fun is that it's got these user accounts. So I'm going to add a user, and I'm going to add a user called Timmy. And there's all these different ways I can store stuff. I could use NT, which is the Windows uh, operating system that it's on, or in this case, I'm going to use password stored as a SHA-1 hash, and I'm going to give it a dangerously simple password, and I'm going to call it M-I-K-E, all lowercase. Do not try such a small password at home, all right? And then what do I want this guy to be able to do with this particular SSH tool? So here we go. Now I've got this Timmy in here, and I want to go ahead now and I want to, first of all, I have to figure out where is this Timmy password. So 
To do that, all I've done there is actually got FreeSSH to save that particular one. So now I want you to watch this. So I had to do a lot of research for this old program, but I dug and dug and I finally found some documentation that says all the passwords with the SHA-1 hash are stored in this little file right here. So I could open this file up and scroll it around. Here I can see some other user accounts I have on here, but here's the Timmy account right here. So that is the actual hash that is storing that password of M-I-K-E. Now, now that I have the hash, that's great, but I need some kind of tool that I can take this hash value and throw it in and say, uh, keep running a bunch of hashes until you find one that matches that. And that process, which we call a brute force attack, can be done all kinds of different ways. Now, for this one particular example, I'm going to use an old program called Kane Enable. Let me show you that guy. So this is Kane Enable. Now, I need to warn you a couple things about Kane Enable before we get started with this. First of all, Kane Enable is a very, very powerful tool, but it's very dated. So even though I'm running a modern Windows 10 system here, there's a lot of features in Windows 10 that really just don't come into play anymore. The other thing is that anytime we talk about cryptographic tools like this is that they're not instantly easy to use. It would be kind of like someone saying, hey, let's go ahead and make an accounting spreadsheet and I hand you Excel. Sure, it's a good tool, but you really have to understand what's going on. So there's a lot of steps in here that simply because I'm familiar with the tool, uh, you, you have to do a little experimentation on yourself. So here we go. So we take a look at this and there is a cracker function right here. You'll see that. And it says, what do you want to crack? So it's all, look, these are all these different kinds of hashes because that's mainly what we're hashing in this world. So I know this is a SHA-1 hash because that's how the FreeSSH stores stuff. So here's my SHA-1 hash tool. So what I'm going to have to do first of all is go over and I'm going to grab this hash. So I'm just doing a regular old copy. And now I need to put it into the cracker. And what I've done now is I've inserted this SHA-1 hash into it. So now let's go ahead and start cracking. So what we're going to do first off is we're going to do brute force. We're basically going to say, look, Kane enable, I want you to start with the letter A, make a SHA-1 hash. Make the letter B, make a SHA-1 hash. Go through all those, then do AA, then do AB, then do ABCD. Get the idea that this could take a little bit of time? Well, it absolutely does. So let's watch what happens. So what we're going to do is a brute force attack. Now, you'll notice that I've got a lot of options here, and all of these crackers have some type of tool like this. So it's going to say just use lowercase and numbers. Now, for the sake of brevity, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make it even simpler than that, and I'm just going to say just use lowercase letters. Now, what I want you to watch right here is the key space. So right now, I'm in the thousands, millions, billions, trillions, gazillions, the number of permutations that it would have to go through to do every possible combination just using the 26 letters of the alphabet, as you can see, is huge. But there are a few other things we know. And again, I'm cheating here, folks, simply because I know that the password is very, very short. What I'm going to do here, now I want you to watch the key space. I'm going to reduce the possible password length. So watch what happens to that key space as I keep making the number shorter and shorter. So one of the reasons why people always say use long passwords is you just saw it right there. The longer the password, the more difficult it is for me to crack it. In a brute force scenario, if you used uh, complicated passwords with upper and lower case and numbers and all that stuff, it starts going into the months, days, years kind of a thing. So what I've done here is I've got it knocked down to a maximum of eight characters and let's go ahead and start it and see what happens. So if you take a look right here, it was pretty much instantaneous, but you'll see it found the password is Mike. So that is one example of brute force. Now keep in mind one more time what brute force is doing. It's literally generating based on the predefined character set that I set up for it. I said start with just the letters of the alphabet and just lowercase and it ground through them. So you can see that it went through uh, just about a trillion iterations in a very, very short amount of time. So 
imagine for a minute, let's take a look at this one more time and imagine this time, let's say I had a big complicated password. So what I want to do now is let's change this. So let's change it so it's going to be lowercase alphabet, uppercase alphabet, and numbers. Do you see that right there? So I got to reset them here a little bit. He still thinks I'm working on the old one here. Okay. Now watch the key space as I start to bring it up. You see that? I'm already up to exponential notation. So that is a really good example of why we use complex passwords. We use complex passwords to make cryptographic attacks harder, period, okay? So that's one example. And in this particular example, what we did is we simply ran a brute force attack. Now, brute force attacks, as you can see, when things get complicated, can become incredibly onerous. Uh, now, this is just a regular middle-of-the-road desktop system. If I wanted to, I can buy computer systems or build them myself that use graphics processors and all this extra power and they can calculate a lot faster but it still becomes very very difficult so what we want to do is I want to go ahead and do an attack but let's make some assumptions one of the things we know about people is that I don't think I've ever met anybody who used a password that was 12xf9l ampersand 2 right what we do as human beings is we tend to use dictionary words Mike 47 and Timmy 22 and one Johnny five and we turn all the O's into zeros and you know all that stuff. Well, if we know that, we can do another kind of attack called a dictionary attack. Now, a dictionary attack starts by using a text file that is filled with dictionary words. It'll take those dictionary words and then it'll manipulate them. For example, if I put the word Mike in the dictionary, I could tell the cracker to go, don't do just Mike, but do capital M, I K E, and then uh, make Mike 1, Mike 2, Mike 47, all that type of stuff. So a dictionary attack will always, always start with a text file that's full of dictionary words. So let's try a dictionary attack. All right, so let's go ahead and grab that hash one more time. And I'm going to go ahead and plug it in here. So there's my hash. Now, the whole idea behind a dictionary attack is we have to feed the attacking tool a dictionary. So I have a very simplified one. If you take a look right here, I've made a little file called dictionary.txt. And you can see that I have all of about, what, nine words in there. Keep in mind that you can download dictionaries from the internet that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of different words in there. So dictionaries can be massive, massive devices. Again, I'm cheating for the sake of brevity, and uh, so we've got that dictionary ready to go. So let's go ahead and do the dictionary attack. So I'm going to go ahead and select dictionary attack this time, and you'll see that I've already pre-selected that text file. Now, this is a pretty handy tool because he always remembers where you left off and I've done an attack before and he remembers I'm at the end of the file so I got to go through this little process and say go back to the beginning and what I'm going to do is start it and boom you can see he pretty much almost instantly got the answer. Now I made this one easy because the password's just four characters and they're all lowercase alphas so again for brevity it works out real well but let's take a look at a little bit more detail here. You'll notice that you tell these crackers how to deal with the particular type of word. So, for example, here's one where it says, uh, here, if the uppercase is in lowercase, then do it also in uppercase. Or if the word in the dictionary is all uppercase, do it in lowercase. Here I could say do case permutations. Now watch if I click that, it actually turns a couple of these off because now it's saying change just the second letter to capital, change the third letter, however that might be. And the other one right here at the bottom might be familiar to some of you guys. Add two numbers to the end. So whatever the word is, you know, so if it's Mike, do Mike 1, Mike 2, Mike 3, Mike 4, all the way up to Mike 99. And I wonder if how many of you guys out there are sitting there go, ooh, yeah, he thing would probably crack my password based on that. So dictionary attacks are fantastic. And they speed the process up simply because they take advantage of the fact that human beings tend to use words they're familiar with as part of their password. So at the top of every one of these dictionaries is password and one, two, three, and one, two, three, four. So don't even bother with those. They'll have you hacked in milliseconds, literally.